I don't think there's any other question I can delegate. Uh, there is an organization, an uh, intergovernmental organization called the South Center. Uh, it's, uh, it's basically a think tank to help the countries of the South, particularly as they negotiate with the countries of the North on a whole range of issues, any issue, health, education, whatever. So the South Center was established some time back, led by the late uh, Julius Nyerere. It's headquartered in, uh, in Geneva, and the reason for that is because a lot of the United Nations negotiations uh, take place in Geneva. So it has to be there to be able to support the countries of the South as they engage in those negotiations. Uh, now, it so happens that uh, I'm currently, I'm the chair of the board of the South Center, uh, which is meeting uh, I hope I've got the dates right in Geneva, and I suspect that on the 29th I'll be in Geneva for that. So you might not see me at the sword turning. <laughs> That's not because I don't support the project. Uh, Tsepo asked a question at the other Tsepo, question about crime. Very, very correct, very important issue. And I really wish, Chapo, that uh, you could have uh, continued to indicate what you think we should do about this question of crime. Because it is not an easy question and needs a lot of thinking. Uh, Vice Chancellor, you remember there was an occasion here. We were celebrating the 150th anniversary of the university. And sitting somewhere here was General Libya, the head of the Hawks. And I said to him, I was very glad to see him. And fortunately, we had uh, a lunch together, sitting next to, to each other after that. And I told him that the reason I was glad to see him is because I wanted to ask him exactly the same question. <laughs> yeah. And I said, General, what do we do about these intolerably high levels of crime? And he agreed. He agreed that he was ready to come whenever I asked him to give me his own answer to that question. It's, it's a very serious issue. I think all of us would agree. But it's very difficult to answer the question, what is to be done? Uh, I'm currently reading a book uh, which deals with uh, trade in narcotics. And I'm learning a great deal about this. That South Africa is linked to many countries which have got this problem of drugs. Brazil, Bolivia, Belgium, all sorts of places. And there are huge volumes of drugs that come through this country. Cocaine from Latin America, heroin from uh, the East, Afghanistan and those places, uh, Pakistan. And clearly, I'm learning a lot about this matter about drug dealing on that global scale. But despite that, if you ask me now, well, what do we do about it? I wouldn't know how to answer that question. It's one of these issues that I think requires a lot of thinking. And part of the challenge with it is that there is too much of the blame 
by the population that points fingers at the South African police service. So this is the principal instrument that as a country we have <coughs> to combat crime. But if the people are correct in saying that a lot of the problem arises from the fact that this instrument of ours is ineffective, that in fact many, many of them, well let me say some, of the police officers are themselves involved in crime, then I'm saying again it becomes very difficult to answer the question what is to be done. Uh, I've heard people say that, uh, why doesn't uh, the Minister of Police uh, allow the National Commissioner to comment on these crimes? He's the first one everywhere. If they steal my boots, he'll be the first one there. To, why? <laughs> I'm saying people raise those questions. I was saying to General Libya that, uh, Many years ago, we discussed policing. This is before 94. And one of the things that we said was that uh, we don't like the SAP, that institution, South African police, of the apartheid system. But we're going to need policing. So what are we going to do? <laughs> Excuse me, so one of the things we decided was that uh, we must, uh, we must uh, redefine the task of the police. The task of the police under the apartheid system had largely had been to arrest people, knock them on the head, lock them up and all. It was an enemy force against the people, certainly the black oppressed. Now we wanted a police service which would be a friend of the people, not an enemy of the people. So we said the first thing to do, whereas the apartheid system called, called these generals and colonels and, and, and the brigadiers, and uh, these, these categories are categories that belong to the army. We don't want a police, a police service that is military. So that's why we removed all of these uh, um, ranks. And that's why even in the Constitution, the National Commission of Police is the National Commission of Police. Uh, it's still called National Commissioner to this day. No generals there. And then one day, uh, uh, a comrade Jay said, Zuma, addressed a meeting in, uh, in Soweto and said uh, these ranks, commissioner and uh, superintendent and, and so on, these are not, uh, you know, the police are faced with criminals and the criminals must shake in their boots when they see a police officer. <laughs> and they'll shake if it's a general, not if it's a national commissioner. So that's how the ranks changed to what they are now. And I'm fighting that they must go back to where, where they were. The, the police must be civilian police, not military police. That's part of the answer to the question, what do we do with crime? So what I can say with regard to this is that, in fact, uh, there are a number of us who are meeting to discuss exactly this question, what do we do with regard to this crime? Because the answer is not easy, but something must be done. And I would like Tsepp to come and join us and contribute some ideas to that, to that question. So some work, some work is going on, some work is going on, has to go on, because we have got to deal with this, uh, with this matter. With regard to the elections in Nigeria, we, I went there as, as an observer. 
So it was not to say anything at all to the Nigerians about this election, but just to observe. Um, so we observed and then gave a report and gave it, left it with the Nigerians, and I don't know what they're going to do with it. Uh, but of course, as you interact with uh, the people uh, you, never mind what an observer, you do, do interact and discuss with them uh, as to what is to be done, even about Nigeria. It was very, very important, uh, it, it being Nigeria, the issues of peace are very important. At all costs to avoid all violence. That's one of the advice we would always give to, to our Nigerian colleagues. Um, and also, also to deal with one another, not as enemies, is, uh, whoever wins is going to have to govern Nigeria. Uh, and whoever loses has got to be part of Nigeria to look at what this governor is doing. So this can't this can be enemies to avoid a situation where you have that kind of tension. I don't know what would, I would say to the South Africans. Uh, Clearly, one of the things that is critically important, which has been legitimately raised, is the youth, the youth vote. This is a very serious matter because it's clear that uh, among this large number of people who don't vote, a large number of them are the youth. Uh, that's, that's a serious problem. If these young people who tomorrow are going to be my leaders, they are letting the country drift whichever way the country wants to go without making an input themselves as young people to say, we don't want this South Africa here, we want it there. It's a political problem. Yeah. The youth, the political, the youth organizations that come from the youth. My view is that they have, they have become very weak. And, uh, and therefore not making an impact on the youth. To say to the youth, the, the future of this country is your responsibility. And you can't delegate that responsibility to anybody. And one of your responsibilities in that context is to vote. And but one of the responsibilities in that context is to have a view. If I come to say to the young people, please vote for me, they must ask me the question why. If I say no because I'm handsome, they said no. <clears throat> we want something much more substantial in order to be able to vote for you. And for a, an organization like the ANC, um, to ask the question, ask the ANC, given what has happened over all of these years, what is it that justifies your, your, your request that I vote for you when there are also so many negatives. I'm saying that the youth, as the youth need to be raising those questions and therefore participating in voting because that's part of the process of determining the future of South Africa. I'm going to come back to this question just now. Uh, but the youth, I'm saying the youth, political youth organizations, the African National Congress Youth League, it's been absent for so many years. 
And yet it was its task, part of its task, to engage the youth, to make sure that the youth are political actors in terms of determining the future of the country. But it's not been, it has not been there to play that role. It's back now, and I do hope that it will focus on that issue. And that should help, that should help, in terms of raising the numbers of young people who register to vote and vote. And that's one of the matters that is very important here in, in this country. There was a question raised about the construction mafia uh, and I think, obviously, this is one of those matters that relate to crime, uh, because you can't have these people who hang around and be demanding these subcontracts. I think it's a, it's, this one is a law enforcement matter, because I think this is just going to be pure criminality. Um, and hopefully it would be dealt with uh, in, in that context. There's a question that was raised about Agoa, and others I didn't quite understand. Could, could the question be posed again? Uh, just one, one, one minute. Incidentally, uh, when, when people speak, they shouldn't speak to the woman like, like that. <laughs> uh, because I can't understand what they are saying. So. A little bit of distance between the mouth and the mic. I, I think, Mr. President, as I was asking the question, I saw that you were in a deep conversation uh, with Prof. I was Prof. asking him what you were saying. Oh, okay. <laughs> <coughs> I submit, Mr. President. Uh, what I was asking, Mr. President, is that the relationship that the ANC or the government has with the Democrats, how will that impact us in terms of remaining in the agora, or will we get kicked out because of the changing dynamics in the political sphere? Okay. Well, I fortunately the. Uh, the, the meeting that was scheduled, I think for November, uh, to discuss the Agawa thing with Americans, will still take place here. Though there was pressure that it must be moved elsewhere. Fortunately, it will still, still take place here. And I mean, if I was in that meeting, this is what I would say to the Americans. That it was very, very correct indeed for the Americans to decide on Agoa in support of the African countries in terms of their development. That that challenge hasn't changed. The need to access those US markets without duties in order to help our continent to develop. That challenge hasn't changed. Even for a country like South Africa, our access to the US markets is important for our economy and therefore even the people who get employed as a result. That challenge remains. Now it's obvious since 1994 we have differed with the US governments on many things. For instance, one outstanding example is when the Americans wanted to go and attack Iraq in 2003. We said no. We objected to that and we gave them all sorts of material to, to show them that there was no such thing as weapons of mass destruction in Iraq. It didn't exist. Uh, we disagreed, they went to war. We disagree about many other things. Now, you can't, you can't base 
a relationship like the Agoa relationship, which has long-term implications. You can't base it on the fact that we must not quarrel about or differ about something. I mean, if there's a condition like that, no, we must not differ on anything, then let's get out of Agoa. I, I, I have a suspicion that uh, there is sufficient maturity uh, among the, the US government not to insist that there should be any change on this Agoa matter. Uh, if I'm wrong, you raise it with me next time. But I, 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 my suspicion is that uh, they understand that continuing imperative to impact positively on these major challenges of development, job creation, and so on. And that they can't walk away from that responsibility as it relates to South Africa, simply because we're differing about Ukraine. Um, there's a, our colleague from the Northern Cape who talked about people being sidelined since 2007, and that includes me. <laughs> it's, a, it's a very serious question. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll broaden it a bit. Uh, the current CEO the current CEO of the South African Institute of Race Relations he made a speech not long ago in the US. It's a very interesting speech and which I think everybody should read. And he says, one of the things he says, that in order to understand South Africa today, you got to look at it in terms of it's different ages, what he calls ages. And he says age number one is a period from 1994 to 2007. That's age number one. Then he says from 2008 up to 2022 is age number two. And then after that comes age number three. And it describes these ages. And it says age number one, 94 to 2007, was a very positive period in our country. It produces many figures. It says, look at this, look at the rate of growth. Numbers of people who are employed grow from eight, to eight million to 14 million during this period. It says here all of these positives. This is the, the CEO of, of the Institute of Race Relations. And then 2008, everything goes down. Factually, I don't think any one of us can challenge him. Because practically, that's what happened. Practically, that's the truth. He does not ask the question, what happened? Because the people who were in government in 94 and 2007, in terms of party, were the same people who were in government in 2008 and 2022. Why do they behave differently? From 94 to 2000, and everything is very positive. From 28, I'm saying the same party. Why? He doesn't pose that question. In order to, to really to get into a fundamental understanding, what is it that changed? Because something changed. Questions that are being raised about what do we do about levels of crime, 
about young people who are not voting. I don't know if our colleague from the Northern Cape has an answer to that question. What happened to change the... Um, in my view is this, colleagues, that uh, fortunately we're at UNISA here, we're at the university and the vice-chancellor uh, spoke about uh, the task of a university. I think we need a lot of thinking, a lot of research. Because <clears throat> these negative things which the CEO of the Institute of Race Relations talks about from 2008 downwards, they're not accidental. Somebody decided that it must happen like that. Look at absolutely everything. We are very fortunate, for instance, that uh, uh, we had the Nugent Commission of Inquiry into SARS. You remember the problem with SARS? The problem with the revenue service was that for many years it was outperforming itself. See, during this period to 1994 to 2007. It's really outperforming itself. And then at a later stage, it started, started underperforming itself. And so the question arose, what has gone wrong? That's how the commission chaired by Judge Nugent was appointed. I don't know if I ask people here, uh, to raise your hands, how many people have read that commission report? I wouldn't be surprised if I don't see any hand. <laughs> it's, it's available there, it's in the public domain, it's in the internet. And what the Nugent Commission says is that this was a deliberate decision to destroy the revenue service. It was prepared for. There's this fellow was appointed as chief, as a head of the SARS, Tom Moyane. Tom Moyane was prepared from 2013. Tom Moyane was appointed head of SARS in 2014. But from 2013, he was being trained by this American company, Bain, to take over as head of SARS. When Bain uh, appeared before the Nugent Commission, and they said to them, you started working with Mr. Moyane on SARS in 2013. How did you know he was going to be appointed head of SARS in 2014. And the answer from Bain was, no, we were told that he has a personal ambition to be head of SARS. <laughs> and so we decided to help him. <laughs> they trained him and prepared him to destroy SARS. The Sunday Times, for a whole year, carried articles about so many bad people in the leadership of SARS. Very bad. When Moyani came in, one of the first things he did was to sack all of these people identified by Sunday Times as bad. After which the Sunday Times apologized that we were very wrong to point those people as bad. And now colleagues, you know that SARS is responsible for 95, 98% of state revenues. 
You destroy science, you destroy this democratic republic. The New Zealand Commission details what happened to destroy science. This is one of the things that happened in this period identified by the CEO of the Institute of Race Relations of this down, 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 this decline. It was very deliberate, very conscious. Some people decided that. I'm saying it's a very specific example with all of the details. To substantiate the point I'm trying to make, that this negative decline, which the Institute of Relations, Relations is talking about, was not accidental. The notion is put about that, no, this was because there were greedy people and there were corrupt people. Yes, indeed, there were greedy people and corrupt people. But there were also other people who had a political objective, which was to destroy the democratic revolution. And those of us who are old enough will remember that uh, the first time we had a national shutdown, load shedding, national, it was in January 2008. Professor Anzov, you remember that? It was January 2008, load shedding, national. The mines closed down for, for a whole week. Serious crisis. And the argument was that the reason for that was because ESCOM had told the government in 1998 that there must be investment in new infrastructure and the government didn't listen. New infrastructure for generation. Government didn't listen. Hence the blackout in January 2008. That story was false. That story was coked up. The reason there was a shutdown in January 2008 is because the people who were in charge of the power stations didn't do what they were supposed to do, which was to replenish coal so that you got coal nearby to, to put it to the power station. They didn't. The power stations ran out of coal, not because there was no coal in the country, because by the people in ESCOM decided, let's shut it down. I'm saying by the lie I was told that, you know, it's because the government didn't do this investment, it was, it was not true. Uh, there is a, somebody who is an old friend of mine. I don't know if he still is, I think he still is. And don't Brian, Brian Molif, eh? <coughs> You know, Brian gets appointed to head uh, ESCOM in 2014, April or thereabouts. And by August 2018, they had finished with the load shedding. Again, all, all of us who are old enough will remember that. Already then, that 2014, they, no more load shedding. 2015, no more load shedding. 2016, no load shedding. It comes back towards 20, end of 2017. 
and all what they did, Brian and his colleagues, was to, to maintain the equipment properly. To maintain the equipment properly so that you don't have to have these shutdowns. Now, if you ask, ask anybody, what did Brian and the others do in 2014, such so that for so many years there was no load shedding? They will they find all manner of reasons. Instead of looking at this one, to, in, to maintain, to repair, to do whatever. And indeed, for so many years, there was no load shedding. He left. After a little while, it came back. So I, I say, it was very correct of Brian, Brian, Brian Mulefe to say, I've been brought from there to here to deal with this matter of load shedding. Let's look at it seriously and act on it, which they did with positive results. So by the time the slow shedding comes back in 2017, 2018, you must be able to guess why. It's because you've got new people who don't behave in the way that Brian Willifel behaved. Why? I think it's deliberate. Seven years after Kusile started, build, started building the Kusile power station, seven years after they started, there was not, not one, whatever you call it, of electricity that was coming from Kusile. After, eight, eight, after seven years, nothing. What ESCOM did, uh, was to contract an Indian company, an Indian company to come and build Kusile. The company came and built Kusile unit number one in a much shorter period than was expected. And Kusile power the unit number one, that it is generating electricity. After seven years, this Indian company was able to solve whatever the problem was. So it is not, it is not as though during the seven years there, there, were no, there were no ideas as to what is it to do in order to make sure that Unit 1 produces electricity. But the people who were there decided that they would not use that knowledge until the Indians were brought in. We used that knowledge, and in no time, Unit 1 was working. And then there's a strange thing that happens. So the Indians are expecting that uh, their contract will be extended so that they do Unit 2 and Unit 3 and so on. No. ESCOM says to them, uh, we will extend the contract on condition you get a PEE partner. So, what the Indians had done, they had brought something like 50, 50 engineers and technicians from India to do this power station. So, they, of course, they say to us, we don't understand what you mean by this black economic empowerment. But, for instance, if you have uh, some black engineers to join ours, so maybe that. No, we don't have people like that. And they were training 150. As they were working on that Kusile thing and Midupi, they were training 150 people. But because they couldn't agree on this PEE thing, they terminated the contract of the Indians. So Indians went home. 
Kosile is still not finished to this day. I'm saying it's deliberate. It's people who have wanted to produce this electric crisis. In the same way that they wanted to produce a resource, a revenue crisis by the destruction of SARS. You look at all of the state institutions. Look at Transnet. Look at what's happened to the police service. Look at the prosecution. All of these things going wrong, systematically. Is it an accident? It's not. That is why I'm saying this question that was raised by our colleague from the Northern Cape is important. It was not only people being marginalized after the 2007 ANC conference. There's a whole process that takes place in this country which still we don't understand. Of a systematic process to ensure that the democratic republic doesn't succeed. That's one of the things I think it's necessary for us to understand. Because it would then help us also to understand even the question that's raised about crime. None of these negative things that happen in this period identified by the CEO of the Institute of Race Relations, none of them are accidental. None of them are a result of greed. So there is greed. So there is corruption. But at the base of it all is to make sure that we fail. <clears throat> it's necessary to understand that. What is it that is wrong in order to be able to find the right answers as to what is to be done? I must apologize for all of this long presentation. But I think it's a matter of strategic importance uh, for the future of our country to understand what went wrong. I'm saying because there were deliberate processes put in place by some people to make sure that this democratic republic fails. That's a matter that still we need to still discuss even with the ANC. I don't think the ANC understands that reality. Um, it is true that you have got many greedy people, many corrupt people. If, if, if I ask the question, I asked the question, why is the ANC, which marginalized people, as we in today, as we are saying, why is it behaving like this? In 2000, not 2000, in 1997, Nelson Mandela says, addressing an ANC conference, that something wrong is happening, which is that as the ANC we are attracting into our ranks people who are not ANC. People don't have these values of the ANC, but they can see that to be a member of the ANC is to have a step ladder to government in order to have the possibility to steal. So. <laughs> That's 1997 National Conference. That message has been repeated in all of the national conferences since then. But nothing has ever been done to get rid of these ones who entered into the ANC without carrying the value system. We, we Beginning of 2020, 
we met uh, 350 leaders of the ANC in Durban. We're talking about the ANC. So I make a presentation about the ANC, what the ANC is, what it stands for, and, and all that. And later, a young fellow stands up and says, President, I do not know this ANC you are talking about. Because I joined a faction of the ANC. It's a faction recruited me, identified itself as a faction. That's the ANC I know. The ANC I know is an ANC organized in factions. This one you are talking about, I have never heard of it. This was illustrating a point that the ANC had accumulated within its ranks, wrong people. Wearing ANC t-shirts, they know how to toy toy and to sing and dance and all that, but they are not ANC. So the last, the 2017 conference, national conference, of the ANC decided the ANC must renew itself, otherwise it will die. <clears throat> that was in December 2017. Nothing happened in terms of that renewal process, nothing. The last conference in 2022 repeats that message. The ANC must renew itself. Nothing has happened so far. But the ANC must renew itself. I say to the ANC comrades that when I, you say I must go campaigning next year to, to say to people vote ANC, <coughs> how am I going to do that to say vote ANC? when I know very well that the, the branch of the ANC in this constituency is led by a criminal. Yeah. You can't. You could, you could, it's not possible to go and say vote the ANC for a criminal. The renewal process is important. But now, colleagues, the, I'm sorry to be talking ANC politics to you. Uh, the obvious challenge with regard to that renewal process is that as, as people talk about this, this ANC must renew itself because it had accumulated wrong sorts of people who are now doing wrong things, being greedy, corrupt, and all this. I look at myself and I say, it's going to catch me, this process. So what do I do? I must block it. I must make sure it doesn't happen. I'm answering our colleague from the Northern Cape to say let's objectively look at the reality he was talking about. It's a much larger reality of our saying a systematic process to destroy the democratic state all around. I'm talking about even the governing party, which has got people within itself who will resist its renewal and therefore perpetuate this reality that you've got people in the ANC who are greedy, who are thieves, who are corrupt. To perpetuate that, if you don't renovate, you don't renew the ANC, you will perpetuate that. That's the reality we've got to deal with. So the question remains, like on the crime issue, what is to be done? What do we do to defeat these people who systematically want to destroy this democratic state? Who are they? If Brian says to me, President, please put one on the here, yeah, I'll throttle him. 
him. I won't be able to produce that person. I think I've answered all the questions. Thanks. <laughs>